<laughs> Central bank. Uh, so the, uh, by hypothesis, we're saying here that the, that the private dealers are coming to the central bank with domestic currency and they're saying, we want uh, international currency for that. We want, we want notes, we want gold, okay? Um, so that means that the uh, central bank has to sell gold or notes, okay, and buy the domestic currency. Which is exactly, you can see, it's exactly what the, you know, it's basically doing what the deficit bank was, is no longer willing to do. If the deficit bank says, I got as much risk as I want, I don't want any more risk. If you want to, if, 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 if there are more people still wanting to, wanting to do this trade, they're going to have to do it with the central bank. That's the idea. So the central bank is now, is now doing, is doing this trade. But it also has a limited amount of gold, is the point. Okay, so what, what else can it do? Before I get to that, note here, plus domestic currency. Domestic currency is a liability of the central bank, okay? So this really just wipes out some amount of currency that is on the liability side here. Okay, these cancel. So really what, what is going on here for the central bank, okay, which is different from the dealer, is a shrinking of their balance sheet. You know, you're losing reserves and you're shrinking the money supply, the high-powered money supply. Okay. If you've had courses in international finance, often they talk about, well, the way you defend the currency is by contractionary monetary policy or something like that. Well, this is now very literally what's going on, but by being a dealer. It just follows from being a dealer. People come to you, the dealers come to you, and they say, I, I, want, uh, I want to sell you some domestic currency. The consequence of that is this shrinking of the, of the balance sheet of the central bank. Okay. It's not intended to be you know, contractionary monetary policy, um, but it's, it's just because the central bank is acting as a dealer here. But as I say, it's got a limited amount of gold and notes, so you can't go on forever like this. And in general, once this starts to be happening, uh, you need to think of, think ahead and say, well, what else am I going to do? So this is one thing you could do, is just pay out reserves freely. Um, the second thing you could do um, is to sell something for reserves. Um, so you could... For example, this is, this is the U.S., so you could sell a treasury bill. Taking delivery in reserves, and then those reserves you can then use uh, to, to do this deal here. Okay? So if you had assets that you could sell, um, you could, you could do, do that. Notice that in doing this, you're going to be putting pressure on the price of those T-bills. Okay? If you're selling T-bills, Right? Those prices are going to be falling, and so, in fact, the interest rates are going to be rising. I'm just noting that for the, the next step of the argument. So just, just note, okay, possibly interest rates are going to be rising here. Um, the price of treasury bills are falling. You're liquidating treasury bills in order to acquire reserves. And then the third logical possibility to acquire re additional reserves Okay, is to borrow them from some other central bank, or maybe even the Bank of England itself. Okay, plus borrowed reserves. That's a liability, plus reserves here. Okay, and basically those are the three possibilities. Um, if you think back to our flow of funds accounting, um, this is selling an asset, this is acquiring a liability, um, and this is getting, is dishoarding of money. So those are the three logical possibilities um, that the central bank can use in order, and, and it has a lot more resources in this regard than the private dealer. That's the point, okay? That the private dealer can't go and borrow, borrow reserves from the Bank of England, you know, they're, or they're, they're a domestic resident here, 
But central banks have more, have more, uh, more resources than this. Um, and the private dealer doesn't have a whole hoard of treasury bills from its, its a special relationship with the, with the sovereign, um, but, uh, but the central bank uh, may do um, as the asset part of its currency liability. Um, and so there, the, the, this is why the central bank can act as backstop. It can acquire and it acts as backstop not so much by holding large amounts of reserves, that would do it too, okay, but mostly by having the ability to replenish reserves, to acquire more reserves by selling some asset um, or, by, or by borrowing, by having relationships with other central banks. What is the difference between um, domestic currency and reserves here? And specifically, what are reserves here? Um, so because we're thinking about the, the uh, so the question is, what's the difference between domestic currency and reserves? Um, we're thinking about the U.S. central bank in a world where the British central bank is the international, is the issuer of the international reserve currency. So here, we're, when we talk about reserves, we're either talking about gold or we're talking about sterling notes that are the liability of the Bank of England. Okay. But this is, again, a very good question because it's always, you always have to keep in mind at what layer of the hierarchy are we? You know, so that if we were thinking about not a central bank, okay, but a bank inside the U.S., the reserves would be domestic currency. That's right. So that's, that's why this, this could be a confusion, that what counts as reserves and what counts as credit depends on where you are in the hierarchy. Okay, so we, and, and this is, I'm really glad for that question because this part of the course, okay, where we're doing foreign exchange is now well, everything we always learned before, but now one layer higher in the hierarchy, okay? Because we're talking, we're talking about relationships between countries, not relationships between banks and central banks inside a country. But a lot of the same principles apply. Some of them have to be more elaborated because the relationship inside a country is all par relationships. You know, there's deposit accounts and there's currency and they trade at par. Here, it's not necessarily so. Right? You have dollars and you have pounds and there's some movement. There's some movement, you know, between these gold points that, that of, of fluctuation. It's not exactly a par relationship. Okay. Very often in economics, when people talk about the gold standard, they abstract from this. They say, well, the gold points, they're kind of narrow, and so we'll just say, just for abstraction, you know, that really these currencies are trading at the mint par ratio. So they're, they're saying as if delta was zero, you know, so that this line is horizontal, okay? This is exactly the, the, the I, I wouldn't say uh, necessarily error, but it is an abstraction from exactly the essence of monetary economics, okay, when you do that. You're, you're getting rid of the dealer function. No dealer would ever make a market if there wasn't, you know, if, if it was you, you, at that. There's no profit there for a dealer, okay? There has to be price movement in order for a So how can there be liquidity if there are no dealers, okay? So you're abstracting from the source of liquidity. And so I never, this, is, this course, as I've said several times, is now putting back in the actual market mechanics that give you liquidity so that we can see them and make them visible. And we're abstracting from a lot of other economics that you, that you, that you know and love um, in, order to bring, in order to bring that in.